We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon and uh, good morning, actually, to our friends in the West. Um, thank you so much for joining us for the second event in this year's Learning Exchange series, More Than a Moment. Today's program is called Driving More Capital to Communities, New Roles for Philanthropy and Their Ecosystem Partners. My name is Valerie Lee, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications at BCC Social Enterprises. Before we get started, I want to address just a few administrative items. Um, first thing, this event is being recorded, and we will share the recording with everyone who's registered for the event via a follow-up email next week, so be on the lookout for that. Um, all attendees will be muted during today's session. But throughout the program, you can submit questions for our moderator and panelists via the Q&A tool, which should be found at the bottom of your screen in the toolbar, in the Zoom toolbar. Um, we're going to hold all of those submitted questions until the Q&A session at the end of the panel discussion. And we will try to get to as many questions as possible, including um, any questions that were submitted when you registered for the event. Um, finally, please feel free to use the chat to share information with your fellow audience members. But just be advised that we're not going to be monitoring the chat for questions for our panelists. So please use the Q&A tool to submit those questions. Um, and with that, now I'm delighted to introduce VCC Social Enterprises President and CEO, Amir Kirkwood. Um, Amir has over 20 years of experience in the community development finance industry. And prior to joining our team, he served as Chief Investment and Network Officer at Opportunity Finance Network which is a national association of CDFIs that helps money flow to communities underserved by traditional finance by providing capital, advocacy, and cap, uh, capacity building for its members. Amir also previously served as first vice president for commercial banking at Amalgamated Bank, where he worked as lead originator for mission-focused lending to nonprofits, CDFIs, impact investment funds, and foundations. He was also senior advisor to the Amalgamated Foundation, a role in which he advised nonprofits, CDFIs, and investment funds on impact finance strategies. And with that, Amir, take it away. Thanks, Valerie. Uh, hello again, I'm Amir Kirkwood, President and CEO of VCC Social Enterprises, uh, which is the parent organization of Virginia Community Capital and Locus Impact Investing. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today, and I thank you for taking time from your busy schedule to join us for today's discussion, Driving More Capital to Communities, new roles for philanthropy and their ecosystem partners. Today represents the second session of our learning, learning exchange series under our theme, More Than a Moment. This theme reflects VCC's acknowledgement that communities have experienced significant change over the last two years and that an energy has resurfaced around critical social economic issues. Our work requires us to remember the roots of the community development movement but also ask how community partnerships with investors, CDFIs, local government, and other community organizers can work together to define community-led approaches to the next wave of community development opportunities. So at this point, please allow me to introduce you to Sarah Strimlau, president of Locus Impact Investing. Sarah has more than 20 years of experience helping philanthropic, nonprofit, and government leaders more effectively, efficiently, and strategically scale and achieve greater impact. As president of Locus Impact Investing, Sarah brings these businesses, skills, and experiences to Locus and to our clients. She oversees the Locus team and works with them across all service areas to amplify their ability to empower philanthropists to leverage their assets and use innovative financing tools for community economic development. And with that introduction, Sarah, I hand today's session over to you. Thanks, Samir. Hello, everyone. It's, it's nice to see you here and thank you for joining us. Um, now more than ever, communities need catalytic capital. As defined in the Tideline re report supported by the MacArthur Foundation, catalytic capital is investment capital that is patient, risk tolerant, concessionary, and flexible. It is an essential tool to bridge capital gaps and achieve breadth and depth of impact while complementing conventional investing. Locus Impact Investing exists to facilitate investment of catalytic capital into communities by philanthropies and mission-driven investors. We believe that communities across the country can seize their unique opportunities and meet their specific challenges when provided with access to more creative, risk-tolerant capital. We believe, in, we believe capital is a tool to drive equity and make a real impact in communities where people live, work, and raise their families. 
Locus is a national nonprofit consulting organization and mission-driven registered investment advisor, providing a comprehensive set of tools to foundations and place-focused impact institutions looking for innovative ways to invest in and transform their local communities. We work with philanthropies to move beyond grant making, adopt more effective and equitable local impact investing practices guided by communities, and make significant investments in communities to achieve greater impact. I am pleased to pass the proverbial mic to Deb Markley, who leads Locus's local investment strategy practice and who is moderating today's panel discussion. Deb, over to you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and as I, as everyone has said, welcome to everybody who's on the call. We really appreciate you being part of the webinar today. As Sarah mentioned, we believe communities need more catalytic capital and that philanthropy, philanthropy must reimagine the ways they invest in and work with communities. Fortunately, we're seeing foundations, especially place-focused foundations that care about a particular geography, finding or even creating opportunities to partner with like-minded stakeholders to build the ecosystem and drive capital into places that they care about. We're really excited to dig deeper into one of those places uh, today and one of those stories today and explore how the Kauffman Foundation is partnering with community development, financial institutions, banking institutions, entrepreneurial support organizations, as they strive to extend credit and services to BIPOC entrepreneurs in targeted low to moderate income neighborhoods in Kansas City. So a very geographic focus. Let me introduce our panel today and then we're going to dig in. And as I wrote this, I realized I feel a little bit like a, a boxing announcer. Bringing the perspective of philanthropy, we have Philip Gaskin, Vice President of Entrepreneurship for the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. He leads the foundation's efforts to build an economy that works for all people by making entrepreneurship a core component of economic development policies, practices, and programs. So welcome, Philip. We really appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Bringing the perspective of a financial intermediary and ecosystem partner, we have Ruben Alonzo III, CEO of AltCap in Kansas City a high-performing CDFI and SBA microloan intermediary providing alternative capital to entrepreneurs and small businesses underserved and overlooked by traditional financial institutions, working primarily in Missouri and Kansas, but expanding into both Houston and LA. Is that correct, Ruben? Did I get that right? Great. Thank you for being with us today, Ruben. Thanks for having, having me. Thanks. And bringing a policy or big picture lens to the discussion, we have Del Gines, Lead Community Development Advisor for the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. Uh, Del is a national thought leader in entrepreneurship-led economic development and ecosystem building and committed to empowering economically distressed communities through innovative economic development strategies. So Del, thanks so much for being with us today. Great. So I'm going to start with, with Philip. And, and this is a story that's going to unfold in three parts, if you will. And, and so I want to start with Philip and ask you to describe the role that the Kauffman Foundation has played in Kansas City in the past and how you have come to step into a new role focused on access to capital for entrepreneurs in these targeted LMI neighborhoods in the city. Sure. And thanks, Deb. Appreciate it. And um, pleasure to be here and welcome everyone. You know, I look at Coffin, actually not new to the capital game and space here in, in, in KC and overall. I and mean, we look at our, our Kaufman Fellows program that started years ago, um, venture capital based fellows program that has now expanded nationally. I think we even have some fellows in other, other countries now and did some education work with the Angel Capital Association to to help get them boosted. So Kaufman so has been in, active in the capital space for a while and realizing that capital is such a big barrier to um, starting, growing, or sustaining sustaining a business. In the, in the last few years, we've um, as we've looked at a more bottom-up approach at one of the systemic barriers that get in the way of people starting and growing businesses, especially 
uh, folks from underrepresented populations is really looking at the, the realizing that there are two prongs to an approach here in Kansas City. One is the short-term capital needed, and one is a long-term systems change needed as it relates to who makes the capital decisions down to who gets the money. Um, and so in the last couple of years, starting in, really in, 20, in 2020, um, working with Alt Altcap, who's here with us today and helping them with their uh, the COVID-19 Relief and Recovery Fund here in Kansas City, of looking at realizing that there are there, um, CDFIs such as Altcap, these alternative ways of getting money to folks, especially microloans, and those uh, folks that sometimes are overlooked are not being looked at as viable to invest in. And so um, an all cap is wonderfully proven out that they are investable and, um, and viable, which Ruben, Ruben can expand on. But it's one of the reasons that we all wanted to do that work in that recovery fund is to prove to um, um, banks and other um, traditional institutions that they can step in too. So we've worked with in the last couple of years with the Kansas City Chamber of Commerce and their task force. There's a capital assets task force where we've been at the table with the institutions and the civic organizations doing a three-pronged approach of one is um, you know, research and participation, looking at different types of study. Axion did a wonderful study a few years ago about capital gaps in Kansas City um, and uh, Brookings Institution and our own research on our access to capital barriers for entrepreneurs and looking at all those things collectively and saying, you know, there's, there's opportunity here for to think through a different system and a different way and a different mindset to get capital to, to people. So is the education part of it as well? And um, granting an uh, Urban Financial Services Corporation to help run a, a lenders training to help un a lenders understand these different markets and some of the uh, work that's needed and ranging from the, the understanding the demographics, understanding the language, understanding the need as it relates to lending. And then the capitalization part in the, in the two ways. And I can expand on that. Deb, I'll stop there because I know it's a lot of information. I'm happy to uh, expand on any other questions. Yeah. Could you speak to the, the outcomes you're seeking through um, particularly through the credit enhancement uh, work that uh, that you just left off on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what what's the change? What do you hope to be different in these neighborhoods at the end of this work with folks? Oh, there's, thank you. Yeah, there's two things I want to see different. One is that traditional institutional lenders change behavior, change behavior and understand that it's okay to dip your toe in the water and lend to low and moderate income neighborhoods that you may not have been doing for whatever reason. That one, um, the economy, the local economy needs you, the potential and existing entrepreneurs need you, and that it's safer to, and it's so it's safer to, to do so. Um, and I think for the, for the entrepreneurs, you know, is, to, is to have a chance, is to be seen as, you know, my, my business, regardless of what people may think of it, uh, it's, it's not the big technology company or whatever it may be, is something to be in. I am something, someone in my business is something to be invested in. And to see that become the norm as opposed to the exception. And so the, 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 the outcomes are one of systems change, normalization through the democratization of capital access, um, with more institutions playing in that. And then other than for the other folks to be able to um, have started and grown or sustained a business more so just because based on the economic data showing that if we don't get more people from underrepresented populations starting and growing businesses, that we're gonna have an economic challenge for years to come. I'm gonna uh, throw you a hopefully not too much of a curve ball here because I, I think it would be really interesting for the folks on this call to understand j just a little insight into how you got to the place where the banks were at the table with you saying, if 
if you help us in this way, if you can create some loan loss reserve capacity, we're, we're willing and able to step into this space. How did you get there with them? Well, I think it's the proof points. And thanks for the question, because a couple of years ago, they, there was it was rather stoic. <laughs> it's like, I don't know about this. And so, um, but the proof points. So, and I don't want to take the th thunder from, from Ruben and Altcap, but when you're able to prove out and show the data, and through, and whether that through national do our capital access lab work or other work we're doing, but then locally, that the number of microloans made during COVID with zero default is the proof point that I think really got the banks to go, hmm, interesting. So those um, business owners that are starting, you know, starting our existing business and we want to grow them, actually they've got their act together more than we thought which they always did, but that's, I'm just talking about their mindset, yeah. right? And so that's the change that we saw, but it was through proof points, but it's also, I think the times and understanding what happened since um, George Floyd and COVID simultaneously, and just seeing the numbers that were no longer deniable, you just cannot deny them. And realizing, I think the, the institution realizing, okay, there's a role for me now. So there's a little bit of a purpose and responsibility, but also some proof that I can jump in. And so making a loan loss reserve, I think was the last thing that was needed to just say, okay, we'll make it a little bit even easier for you. We'll put this up and you'll have this as backing to show how much we really want to support you in that changing behavior and coming in. A final question, and then we'll we'll dig in with Ruben a little bit here. But why is this such an important move for Kaufman to be taking right now? Both, both, you know, you personally leading this work, but also for the foundation and and for Kansas City. Um, I'll start. Well, I'll start with the personal first, and some some uh, may have heard me uh, on this, and some of the speeches I've done is. You know, I didn't know the word entrepreneurship. My dad didn't know he was an entrepreneur, but he was. And I remember starting in fifth grade, how many times he took me with him. He picked me up from school and we'd go to the bank and we went to the bank all the time over like four years. So why do we go into so many banks? And he finally said, you know, I'll tell you when you get older, but it turns out it took him four years to get a loan to open up a convenience store in South Central Los Angeles because of the zip code that we lived in, because of the color of his skin and a couple of, and the credit score always being 11 points too low or whatever it was. <clears throat> and so I just don't, you know, I wake up every morning, I don't want anyone else going through that. Um, and so that's personally what drives me. Um, and um, I think for, for Kaufman, it's just realizing that the, the urgency of now, realizing the actor that philanthropy can be and should be in a place-based role and understanding that, especially as we look at a foundation that prepares people for the workforce and prepares people for being an entrepreneur, um, that we had a role. And it's just very, very important to be more, even more active, but in a, in a systems change way. I think it was a very profound moment for us. Great. Ruben. Let's let's start by just giving us a little bit of history about Altcap as a CDFI and uh, the role you've played as a capital provider in in these same targeted neighborhoods in Kansas City, and kind of the impact and and to the extent that you want to speak to uh, some of the doors that that Philip opened in his comments, please please do. Yeah, and I'll I'll start by saying I mean we <clears throat> we really started from ground zero here in Kansas City. Um, I mean, there, there was uh, a bank CDFI here in Kansas City. We had some CD, national CDFIs, um, you know, somewhat active in Kansas City, but Altcap really was the first kind of locally based, small business loan focused CDFI. And actually, we, we started out as a CDE to begin with. So um, we really created to, to bring new markets tax credits to, to Kansas City and use that to, to finance, um, you know, job creating businesses, catalytic real estate development projects. Uh, and that really laid the foundation for us to, to kind of move into this kind of CDFI lending space and um, really cut our teeth on, on, on alternative financing. Um, but throughout that whole process, I mean, we were, you know, developing relationships and specifically with, with the Kauffman Foundation, but also working with, with Dell, the Fed and 
on kind of laying the groundwork for how um, you know all these different stakeholders can come together and, and really start to um, bring um, the the right resources to support you know economic development, small business lending um, in Kansas City. So we uh, we just position ourselves to uh, to be the vehicle to do that. Um, but it, it really took took time and. Uh, took um, yeah different like I said different stakeholders uh, especially philanthropy especially our banking partners um, to do that and um, the last two years with COVID I think really um, was kind of the um, the culmination of a lot of that hard work and that trust that was built um, to really allow the banks um, you know Coffin Foundation and some other foundations um, uh, the community uh, um, you know as a whole to support. Uh, a loan fund that we stood up to uh, to provide kind of critical financing um, to small businesses to weather the weather the storm. So um, I would say, you know, as as like most CDFIs, we're very geographically targeted, but um, you know, we're also very people people focused too. So very place and people uh, based lending, um, which uh, gives us you know a, a, um, a lot of opportunities to. Um, to direct our capital to where it's needed the most, and it can't be done. It can't it just can't be done alone. It has to be done with, uh, with all the other stakeholders. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I just want to lift up the one thing that you said about just that trust building because I, I know in, just as I think about some of the other initiatives that are really sort of ecosystem focused, you've got to spend the time building those networks and that trust. So that you can be responsive in in the situation of of like COVID presented to us. Um, Absolutely, the trust. I mean, and trust and awareness education. It's, it's we're still doing it, but um, you know, for for us, um, yeah, you, you have you have to have that that trust and that that understanding, education, awareness about um, CDFIs to really make this successful. Yeah. So, can you talk, Ruben, to about some of the barriers that you face as a community development financial institution in supporting BIPOC and low and moderate income entrepreneurs trying to drive capital into these neighborhoods and communities? Yeah, I mean, I'll go back to what I said about, you know, us being very place-based in terms of delivering capital to communities that are underserved or overlooked by mainstream finance or traditional financial institutions. Um, you know, for us to do that, we need capital. And there's still a, a you know a, a significant um, you know um, level or perception of risk in the communities that we're trying to bring capital to, and um, you know I, I think over time we, we're we're trying to um, dispel that notion that you know um, these businesses are not credit worthy, these entrepreneurs are not credit worthy, um, but I think that 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 still remains. There's still you know to a certain degree redlining that goes on. Um, in a lot of our um, BIPOC uh, our communities of color. So um, that's definitely a, a, you know, a challenge that we continue to, to uh, have to overcome. Um, but I think, you know, uh, again, with our track record, our history, I think we've demonstrated that um, we understand these commu the, the communities. We understand, you know, this quote unquote markets, um, the entrepreneurs that, that we have focused, you know, um, providing capital to. And uh, I think that's, that's allowed us to um, to access additional capital from um, from the banking community or philanthropic community who want to support um, you know the more more uh, more capital flowing into these communities. Yeah, yeah. And and I, I'm I'm going to frame this question as you know the role that you see Kaufman and other foundations playing in helping you overcome some of these barriers, but. But I don't think it's just philanthropy. You know, where where do you see what are some of the the levers for helping you overcome those barriers? The partnerships. What do you most need? I guess yeah. is another way to put it. I mean, philanthropy is a big yeah. lever. It's uh, and I think um, you know, Coffin is is definitely um, leaned into to their role and um, you know, finding ways to to support not just. Alt cap, but uh, other CDFIs that um, you know I think it can have an impact not just in Kansas City, Missouri, but you know the heartland generally, where there's um, just a dearth of of high impact, high performing CDFIs. I mean, we've got um, some other CDFIs here in Missouri, Justine Peterson, and um, but outside of 
um, the um, Justin Peterson and a couple others, there's, there's really not a lot of CD5s that are, that are focusing on um, small business lending. So I think there's a huge role for, um, you know, for philanthropy, community foundations to really step up and, 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 and really kind of build off of some of the, the things that um, we've proven are uh, successful models for um, not just capitalizing CDFIs, but you know, uh, giving them the ability to um, to partner with with banks uh, to support more more small business lending. Yeah. And Ruben, and and uh, this this might be a broader question, but um, you mentioned the the heartland is a place where there just isn't a lot of uh, density of of CDFIs. We've done a lot of work in in Indiana and in uh, part, especially parts of more rural parts of Kansas where yeah. that infrastructure just doesn't e exist. And so where, where do people turn? Where does philanthropy turn if there isn't that kind of CDFI partner on the ground and you want to be driving capital to the kinds of entrepreneurs that you've been working with? Yeah, I think they have to be willing to invest in CDFIs. Um, you know, we're, we, um, we can't serve um, even just the Kansas City Metro on our own, um, there's there's plenty of demand here. So I think um, Coffin, you know, was a big part of uh, us being able to scale, um, you know, um, um, giving us access to the resources we need to grow and, and serve more small businesses. But I think more foundations need to kind of take that leap um, and and work with with established CDFIs that can expand into to those mar more markets to the heartland and we're, we're certainly open to that and are excited to to see how we can bring out we feel our unique um um you know uh, unique strategy for bringing capital to to communities whether it's you know through our micro loan small business loans but also through you know our, our impact investment affiliate equity squared uh, but I, I think it really takes um you know philanthropy to kind of take that leap of faith and and and, and do some of the things that um, foundations like Kaufman has done or Kresge or other foundations have really, really been focused on CD5 industry. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. And I think that um, it's one of the things that we keep trying to lift up it at Locus is where foundations like Kaufman are stepping into that really creative space. So I, I appreciate that, that perspective. So Del, we'll turn to you now. Um, I'm gonna start by a, a few years ago, you and Rodney Sampson wrote a, a piece on inclusive entrepreneurial ecosystems that um, I know was really compelling for me. We, we actually used it in some work we did in up in Rochester, New York. It was a really important framing, I think. So thinking beyond Kansas City, helping us zoom out a little bit, can you speak to the importance of bringing a a strong equity lens to the work of building stronger investment ecosystems in underinvested places. Um, sure, I, I put two links into the chat. You know, the first is just I wrote a guide called the Funders Guide to Supporting Small Business Support Organizations a few years ago, addressing some of the stuff um, you know Ruben was talking about. I mean, philanthropists first need to know that they can, and then need to know what they look for, look what to look for, and there's. There's not really a lot out there. I know, you know, Kaufman has been a big supporter of Entrepreneurial Finance Network with a lot of foundations that are trying to figure out how to effectively fund, you know, small business um, support in their respective communities, whether it's local or geographic. But by and large, you know, the the, the philanthropic sector has prioritized. I mean, I mean, they can do what they want. It's their money, right? So, you know, it's our job to kind of communicate to them, which is something I told local philanthropists because I'm from Omaha. On one of our biggest major foundations, I told her, I said, we don't want you here. Like, the, we want you to be able to fund panda bears in our zoo. We don't want you to have to fund kind of these critical needs. And the reality is, is that the only way that philanthropists can get out of the business of the social service and human service funding is through economic empowerment and economic development funding. But that's a shift in mindset and potentially a shift in regulation. So these are, these are things that, um, you know, we need to keep in front of them and continue to educate them. And I think um, Kaufman leading the way, you know, and showcasing kind of what uh, Ruben has done in the Kansas City marketplace with these proofs of concept is a way that we can begin to continue to make the argument um, for that. Now, returning to the conversation around equity, like uh, you, 
if you want a robust economy, you can't leave large segments of your society out of, outside of the economic growth standpoint. And we've done it historically, and we've been able to get away with it in certain ways because of you know the rise of industrialism and corporate structures and things like that. But but you still have these huge drags on the economy um, when you have large population percentages that can't you know participate in the um, capitalistic process through entrepreneurship. And even when we do, like I wrote the report on black women and I showed that despite producing a million businesses a year, uh, over a decade, which is uh, in my understanding the fastest in American history, their average size is $27,000 uh, of the annual sales. And a lot of that is because they're not receiving the same equitable support in the credit marketplace and the ecosystems. And so what would happen if you took a million and they just jumped up by 10,000 in revenue, a million times 10,000, I can't do the math off the top of my head, but that goes back into the growth of these respective communities. And so it's really, really important that I don't care what facet of economic development that you're in, whether it's micro business, entrepreneurship, or even how you're going to pursue major corporations. If equity is not at the center with the demographic shifts that are occurring in America, you're, you, you are creating a recipe for disaster for your local economy. And that's the, the absolute worst case scenario. The best case scenario is you have these huge and continued gaps uh, in the economy where you're going to need to leverage the tax base through social service programs, human service programs, different tax redistribution, uh, uh, just to address the issues of poverty. So um, the concept of equity has to be a foundational element in everything that our community and economic developers do. And I'm, I'm still arguing that the best way to do it is through entrepreneurship and leveraging the ecosystem and the power of developing ecosystems and supporting organizations like Rubens and those are that they're connected with to be able to make it happen because they're on the ground yeah. and they're responsive and they're listening and they're hearing and they have the ability to be more flexible than a financial institution may have due to regulatory constraints. That's a that's a great uh, a, a great point and really appreciate that perspective um, on, on this. It's one of the reasons why I, I mean, personally, but also in the work that Locust does, we believe so much that philanthropy has a seat at the economic development table because they're often bringing that equity lens to say, you know, is this allocation of resources really going to benefit everybody? Is this going to really create Philip, to uh, the uh, your bio, an economy that works for everybody um, in in the process. So um, appreciate that. Dell, can you speak to some of the policy levers that you see out there to encourage more of the kind of collaborative work across the public, private, and philanthropic sectors? I mean, it yeah. collaboration is hard work. It takes years. It takes trust building. So what, from a policy standpoint, can we do to be encouraging more of this kind of work? Yeah, and, and you know, Deb, we, in our pre-call, I told you we, we were gonna talk about it. The views of this presentation do not necessarily represent the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. So, so first of all, we really need to look at the regulatory structure of, of, of the financial institutions. Again, this is me only. Like when we when we talk about this term, and I, I can't remember if it was Ruben that used it, um, you know, loan loan ready or or things like that. There's a lot to unpack in that, right? <laughs> like we say it as if it's a universal, you know, given construct that existed before the beginning of time. No, people put these things together and they said this person is good, that person is not, right? So we need to be examining, you know, how we regulate our major financial institutions in different areas. And yes, we need safety and soundness of our, our financial institutions, absolutely. But what are the spaces that we can create within the regulatory burden where it doesn't put you know, their capital structure at risk, but it allows them some flexibility to maybe do some things um, in non-traditional markets that they couldn't necessarily do now. That's point, uh, point one. Second, we already have a lot of policies in place that we can use. Um, you know, Look at community development block grant funding. Uh, Ruben, I'm not sure if you get any of those in the Kansas City marketplace, but I used to run a micro lender that two policies, one, one my older crowd will remember. Remember when Bill Clinton created the enterprise zones? We got money through enterprise zones way back in the day when I left that organization in 2004, 
Uh, and actually, let me fast forward even further than that. Like eight years after I left, they were still lending money that came through Clinton Enterprise Zone funding. That's the power of, of lending. Like if, if a philanthropist gives Ruben a million dollars, that's not a one shot deal because he's recycling that through the loan process and portfolio and he can multiply by 10, 11, 12 times, depending on the loan, you know, loss attrition. So we have policies, community development, block grant funding, CSBG funding, other state municipal, um, you know, grants and allocations that can be pivoted to supporting, you know, entities like CDFIs and other lenders of small business supporting ecosystem buildings. So a lot of the things we don't even have to create that are new. If we look at our economic development, um, you know, but most people don't realize almost 60 to $70 billion goes through the states every year in incentive-based economic development to attract firms. I mean, most black communities aren't gonna get Amazon. I'm sorry, you just aren't. So, and then when we do get these major companies, there's a mismatch alignment between the jobs they bring and the jobs the community needs. Right. So we can repivot a lot of these and say, okay, if we're gonna give a tax break to a major corporation to come into our communities, how can we restructure that? So like Network Kansas, Network Kansas gets allocations of tax credits that they can sell in the marketplace. And then they push that out through their e ecosystem e-communities over 66 in the counties. They sell those, that funds the loan portfolio, which is locally managed. So uh, there's a lot of things that we could do. I think the question is, is there a political will to do it? And that's where webinars like this, conversations like we've had, um, Kaufman and Ruben kind of showing proof of concept of what they do, gives us more ammunition to go to policymakers and say, hey, if we really want to, to build our local economies and communities that have been left out, these are some ways that can do it. And yes, they, they do show a return on investment and they aren't as risky as you originally thought. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll frame this question. This is a, a, an additional question that's just come up as I listen to this conversation, but I en encourage Philip and, and Ruben to chime in on this as well, because a theme that's been throughout this is perceptions of risk and what what is risky and what's not and how do we do we have the data to to say lending into these communities isn't really as risky as as you think and i i know that this is important for the community investment guarantee pool that locus manages trying to gather the data and the evidence to be able to bring back into the field and say here's the experience Here's the real risk that exists in these in lending to these communities or these CDFIs. And, and how do you how do you create the forum for that data to be influential to policymakers? You know, what what's that forum? Um, and so Dell, it can go to any of you, but I'm just really curious about that because it feels like there's really good information bubbling up here. But where, where does it get aggregated so that there's such a compelling message that it begins to change behavior at the policy practice community level? Thoughts? Yeah, I love one of the things that, and, and thank you for that, and, and really continuing on the Dell's comments there, which are excellent. I am, um, it is about influencing policymakers and how to get how to get them to get the information as clearly as possible. And so one of the things that we've been working on over the last three years is something I'll drop in here in the you know, um, America's new business plan, which is a nonpartisan plan for policymakers and it's focused on creating new good jobs and rebuilding an economy that works for everyone. And there are four pillars to it equitable access to opportunity, equitable access to funding, equitable access to knowledge, and equitable access to support. And you can feel free to, to, to download it there because it's about getting exactly what you're talking about, Deb, is about get, how do we start to get these statistics and other things, these proof points into people's hands that make decisions and pull levers. And something, this is our third iteration of it. We did a congressional briefing in DC about six, uh, five, about five weeks ago to really go over that and, and, and understand what policymakers can tangibly do. Now, we don't advocate, I mean, we, we don't lobby because we cannot lobby, but we've created a coalition that's called the Start Us Up Now Coalition of over 200 organizations that are out there advocating for what's in it at the local, state, and federal level. So it's, you know, it's one, it's one effort there to do exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and so 
it's a resource for folks yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, I'll Go add to driven. that. I mean, it's it's definitely you know a challenge um, to continually you know aggregate that data and kind of distill it and and report it in a way um, that um, you know that that really resonates with with a, a policymaker or even a funder. Um, I do feel like you know we're we're getting better at kind of um, um, really f focusing on the data that I think really matters in in our industry too. I mean, aside from kind of the traditional economic development, you know, metrics that I think we're all you know tracking, you know, whether it's job creation or revenue increases in businesses. I mean, uh, some of the data I think is maybe even more powerful and needs to be kind of um, you know shared more are things like you know um you know are our loans getting to to businesses that you know have have had the most challenges um right. accessing this capital i mean is, is this capital getting to the business that need, need it the most how do you how do you measure that you know um are uh are, are we getting capital to to businesses that you know have been previously denied a loan by by a business so um, I feel like that that's that's something that you know we we try to do ourselves, but um, certainly can can help doing collaboration with an organization or an institution like Federal Reserve Bank or, or Coffin Foundation. Yeah, and and I, I guess my my only addition would be that risk is relative. Mm -hmm. Like risk is very relative. Um, I've been banging, I've been politely banging on the um, micro lending industry for a couple of years now, because is it better to have a four percent loan loss reserve? or loan loss or have a 90% loan loss, but the business, the one business that fails or the 10% produce X amount of economic growth. So it depends on the lens that you view it. Mm -hmm. If you view it from the lens of an economic developer who's looking at net growth over time or venture capital investor where uh, three out of every four of their businesses fail, but the expectation is that that one is gonna recoup plus, then it's a different perception of risk than what we currently have, which is still very embedded within the traditional banking model system and so i've argued that if we we look at the risk profile from an economic development lens from a versus a loan portfolio lens then you have a dramatically different range of potential tools you could develop because you're looking at the output of the portfolio as a, a on net versus a specific metric of of the loan loss um within the the process and you can have both i mean and I, but a lot of loan um pools like cdfis and other micro lenders get are usually necessitate you know a, a low loan loss because they have to pay let's say a one percent back to the lender or EQ2 or all of these other you know things like that. So this is this is where we need to begin to ask the we need to advocate for and ask the question of policymakers and also practitioners how can we innovate in this space in a more material way so that we're when we say the things like risk that inherent in that term risk we're not embedding bias, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, right. like, yeah. Yeah. like we're not embedding bias in the term risk. Um, and these are conversations that often aren't had because we've had very strongly built up industry over time. And once, a, you know, once an industry of policy situation is built up, it's harder to change it. Exactly. And so, but these are the conversations that we need to push. You got to start the business plan, um, marriage business plan. You got the cool work that's being gone, but how do we amplify it is the question that I would ask our audience. Yeah, yeah. And Deb, I dropped just yeah. another like capital specific report and update on the on the barriers to capital, but also opportunities. Again, it's proving out what we have a lot in this report is proving out and profiling fund managers and entrepreneurs that that prove out mm -hmm. that um, you know whether it's debiasing the word risk or whatever else the word is, they're not as much as a risk yeah. and are a new market for folks. So I think there's a there's a, uh, anyway, that'll take us down a whole other subject. I know. <laughs> we got to stay on time. I'll, yeah. <laughs> I won't go. No, I won't go to that. Well, and um, just to Dell's Dell's question for any of you who are in the audience, if you have have thoughts on that policy question, feel free to pop them in the chat or to um, to put something in the Q and A. Let let me. Um, I think it's always important to speak directly to our our um, our audience here and give a a bit of advice and counsel, if if you will. And I know we have a pretty diverse audience. There are some foundations, there are some CDFIs, there's some 
uh, a good number of folks who were engaged in, in local or state economic development. So Philip, starting with you, for, for foundations in the audience, what, what would you suggest? And, and this was, um, uh, we had some questions along this line, but what would you suggest as a first step if, there, if a foundation is considering stepping into this new role and forming new partnerships, particularly around the issues related to, to capital and economic development and entrepreneurship, what should they do? What counsel would you give them? Uh, listen, understand the community and understand the most, what are the most critical issues in the community? It's work that Dell has done amazingly is really pivoting and understanding, getting people to pivot and understand how you get to really learn and understand what the community needs. And that's really important for philanthropy if you're doing place-based work or you if you believe that you're servicing the community. Are you doing something what you believe it needs or do you truly understand? And so, you know, the former community organizer in me comes out, of, have you knocked on enough doors with a clipboard and a number two pencil <laughs> to really figure out and understand what's truly, what's in, in that pulse um, of the neighborhood? And I'll give you just an, an, an example. If we look at, this goes back to the earlier question, but if we look at um, what communities may be asking for is different than what they've been giving the opportunity zones and the paycheck protection program two examples, right? So in opportunity zones, you know, one of the things that we did was, was pivot and sort of went to targeted zones that were formerly in redlined areas and focused that helped to help focus our and other folks' attention to that versus what the opportunity zones were asking. Because what happens is that so much of the money was not flowing to where it really treated, it really um, yeah. needed to be. Paycheck protection loan uh, program, same thing. The, the money didn't go and didn't flow to where it was needed. And what where it did go, did anyone really ask the question is, what can now be constructed here or developed here? Is it what you truly need? So yeah. I, I just, I, I really start with that. just really, truly understanding um, before you delve in, have you asked the right questions? And do you know, understanding people have been especially in underrepresented populations, have been over-surveyed and over-questioned, okay. right? And so you're really gonna have to really think through how do you engage in a way that is nutritive and supportive and nurturing, and that you truly are coming with a result and care in mind versus we're here for a bit and then we're gonna step away. Don't do that anymore. Yeah. Wonderful advice and um, I'm glad this is being recorded so that we can get it out there to a lot of national foundations out there. So Ruben, so for the, the CDFIs or even some of the banking institutions that might be in the audience, what, what would you suggest as a first step of, as they're looking to partner with philanthropy? And, and this was one of the questions that was provided before. You know, how, how do you approach philanthropy? How do you figure out where there's an alignment of, of interest and mission, um, particularly, again, it's, as you're talking about trying to drive more capital into communities and neighborhoods that have just been left behind by traditional financial intermediaries. Yeah, um, I, I recognize that, you know, not every CDFI out there is fortunate enough to have a multi-billion dollar uh, foundation, you know, that's focused on entrepreneurship <laughs> in, in their city. So, there was a, uh, yeah, just, um, you know, we're, we're lucky to have such a mission alignment with um, uh, such a major uh, foundation here in Kansas City, but um, we have definitely made headway with um, other foundations and um, the philanthropic community here in Kansas City and some of our other markets that we're in now. And, um, you know, I, I will say it helps to to have a track record with a foundation like like the Coppin Foundation, and they've certainly um, helped to um, to make introductions or, or um, you know, uh, support um, our our efforts to to work with other other foundations, but I, I think it's you know it's it's definitely you know um, getting you know getting enough of um, you know your story together uh, to be able to share um, with with the philanthropic community about about the impact that and the role that you play in your community and uh, as a 
just a small business loan focused CDFI. Um, you know, we've got a lot of stories, a lot of things that we can, we can talk about. And certainly after the last two years, a lot more uh, about the critical role we play in, in terms of ensuring that the flow of capital gets to, to communities and small businesses that need it the most. Um, so I, I think, um, yeah, just um, uh, kind of developing those, those relationships. It really does start, start there. And um, uh, I, I think the, key, um, the community foundation um, uh, is definitely, uh, you know, uh, a, a subset of the philanthropic community that I feel has an interest and desire to, to play a role um, with CDFIs. I think they, they just need to understand, you know, how, how to do that. Um, so I think uh, being able to come, you know, approach these, these relationships with, with options, with solutions is, is always good as well. Yeah. You're, you're, you're speaking to the community foundation space that is near and dear to, uh, to, to our hearts because the, we just see so much potential and, and just commitment to at that community grassroots level that is so important uh, for the kind of community engagement that you were talking about, Philip. You yeah. know, just um, they are in and of the community for, for the most part, for the most part. Yeah. So. And I, I'll add, I add one more piece of advice sure. for, for the CDFIs out there. Uh, I mean, use use your CDFI as a platform to to put, position yourself as a leader, as a thought leader um, in your community about economic development or community development. Um, so not just small business lending focused CDFIs, but CDFIs that focus on housing or um, you know or, or, or health centers or charter school financing. You have a role to play and a voice that needs to be heard in your community about um, various economic and community development issues. Um, so you need to kind of again use your use your CDFI as a platform to to put yourself out there. Yeah, great great advice. Mm -hmm. So Dell, um, I I know we have um, some public officials and economic development professionals on on the webinar. What would you suggest as a first step if they're trying to build a broader set of partnerships, you know, with philanthropy, CDFIs, and others? to help create this more inclusive and effective ecosystem? Where, where did they start? Coffee's real cheap. I mean, you I, you think I'm joking, but I, I go around the nation speaking on this stuff and I say, you know, ask people you don't know to coffee in this that, that are people you normally don't connect with and ask them how they're doing, ask them how they're seeing the world, especially if they're, they're uh, 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 people of color, women, people you normally aren't connected with and sit down and listen to that lived experience. Um, you know, when I ran a five-year grassroots economic uh, ecosystem building program in Northeast KCK, I literally sat down with 40 people over coffee and asked them what they what their opportunities and challenges were in their community and, um, you know, explain what I wanted to do and what their thoughts are were before I ever tried to do anything in that community. I had a list of 80 more people. Mm -hmm. um, that I couldn't get to. I said, at some point I have to start, right? Mm -hmm. So like what the, the challenge right now is it's a policymaker philosophy. Are you a democratically, by that I'm not talking about the party, I'm talking about just minded, democratic minded where you're making policy in conjunction with the lived experiences of people or are you more of a, a, a authoritarian centric? Well, I got elected and now it's up to me to make these decisions. Because if you truly want to engage around this topic, you know, I would be having coffee with Ruben on a regular basis. I'll be having coffee with Philip. I'll be having coffee with the Black woman entrepreneur down the corner. Um, you know, I'll be having coffee with them together and let's see what we can all come up with. Like th these are things that, like we try to make things so hard and so complex, but most of the stuff comes down to human relationships and interaction and empathy and understanding and then designing from that point. And so policymakers, first of all, I, I would just get acquainted with the field if it's new. And I understand for many, it will be. Um, and that means, you know, reading up on it, seeing who's out in the space, again, having coffee, maybe doing focus groups, things like that to get to the knowledge, and then really leverage the relationships that you have to come up with some novel policy solutions to, you know, enhance the fundings of CDFIs and other organizations in your ecosystem. Yeah, great. Great advice, um, and, and appreciate that. I'm, I'm going to throw a, um, a final question out and then we're going to open it up for Q&A from the, the audience. So please keep the questions coming into the, the Q&A box in there. 
also just want to point you to the chat because I know there's some good resources that have been popping up. Um, I, I saw something from Kathy Dolan in there. So there's some good resources and, and encourage you to take a look in the chat. But I rec fully recognize that CDFIs aren't the only partners um, in, in an ecosystem, but they, they are pretty critical partners for, um, for philanthropy. We, we see it, especially um, in the work we're doing with community foundations. It just is a much lower entry point if you have a, a partner that is mission aligned and has the expertise that, that CDFIs have. And Deb, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, yep. but, but remember, this is it's a bank partnership too. Like every yep. CDFI is automatically qualified for Community Reinvestment Act credit. So like you have this dual tier of opportunity with CDFIs that a traditional, um, let's say non-certified CDFI organization won't have. That's, that's, a, that's a really good point, Dell. Thank you for, for making that. So I wanna ask, and, and, and I was gonna actually ask if, um, if Amir would be willing to uh, respond to this question first, and then I'll open it up to the panel. But having come from OFN in the past, but if we're thinking about how to um, address some of these really systemic capital challenges, what policy support is needed to ensure that CDFIs are a strong industry for the future? You know, if we're gonna encourage philanthropy into this space, how do we make sure that the CDFI sector is, is thriving as a partner for the future? Really good 800 pound <laughs> <laughs> gorilla type question. I didn't promise uh, you an easy question, Amir. You really didn't. Thank you so much, Deb. Um, I think there's there's a couple of things, and Dell kind of alluded to this a little bit in the difference between the different types of CDFIs. Um, there's nonprofit loan funds, obviously, there's banks, there's credit unions, and each of them, I think, have a different interaction with sources of financing from the, the federal side. So there are a number of different uh, approaches I would sort of suggest that all of them take uh, when it comes to seeking federal support. The main thing I think though, is we are less to have uh, an entire agency within the US Treasury Department that supports our work. And, and there's so many areas of, of uh, community-based work, uh, philanthropy, uh, social enterprise work that would dream to have a now 25 year, I think it's 20 years, I'm sorry, old agency that uh, knows the ways around Washington DC to support the work of the field. And right now, you know, we're into a pretty big fight um, in DC right now to get what we believe should be a billion dollars of annual uh, appropriation for the field, especially given CDFIs nationally have done well over, you know, a quarter trillion dollars of financing. And the idea of a billion dollars of grant support as equity seems pretty small relative to the return you're getting from CDFIs across the country. Um, I think another really powerful thing right now is that there is a legislation, and it's actually bipartisan, knock on wood, to support the idea of creating a billion dollar tax credit that would support private sector investment in CDFIs. And so the significance of that is um, you really don't scale in finance in, in, in global markets or even national markets until you can create tools that attract the private sector. It's just, it's why there's a $3 trillion, $4 trillion municipal securities market. They figured out how to sell mom and pops across the country bonds. We're at a, as a field doing work that's just as vitally as important, uh, but the amount of tools for reaching the, the, the private markets are very limited. Mm -hmm. So Supporting that legislation it would be huge because it could go to everything from, um, you know, common equity for CDFIs that are banks to if Ruben stood up another form of a, uh, like a CDE on a ta new market tax credit side, he could stand up a, a, a fund and that fund could be eligible for those tax credits. And it all just, again, goes to more capital uh, available for our field to do do the work we do. Uh, so the policy fight is right in Washington, D.C. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll add to what Amir said. It's not just, you know, the, the scale of, of capital, but also just 
the the access to a capital market that's reliable and and there so that CDFIs can can plan long term, you know, for for whatever kind of lending that they want to do uh, and the growth that they want to see in their or you know volume that they want to see in in their lending. That that is um, very very critical for for you know growing this this the CDFI industry and community. Other comments? If not, we're going to start open up to the q and I know we've got a, a number of questions in there. All right, I'm going to start grabbing some questions. And, and Ruben, I think maybe we, we start with this question targeted to you. Um, the, the anonymous attendee is what, what it says. Um, ask for examples of, of what was described as a mi mixed funding approach where you have funding to support aspiring entrepreneurs, but you also have funding to support accessing some of the capacity building and support services. So I wonder if you could speak to Cap's experience with, I assume we're talking about lending capital as well as the capital to do the other really important work that CDFIs do. Yeah, really important and uh, um, also probably the most challenging is, is figuring out um, yeah, the, the technical assistance or business development services and how to fund that. You know, AltCap, um, I think by the nat by just the nature of our, our work and, and our um, you know, high touch and uh, interaction with, with our, our prospective borrowers or businesses that we work with, I mean, we're providing kind of TA throughout our application process um, but, you know, the added value TA and business development services, we've essentially outsourced that to our ESOs or entrepreneurship support organizations because um, it's just something that, you know, we, we, we just have not figured out how to kind of bring that on and, and integrate that into our, our operation and, and, and make that financially um, viable. Um, but I, we're definitely working on it and very committed to it. And I think other, I mean, other CD5s have, have figured out how to do it. Um, we're just still still working on that, but yeah. um, that is, that is definitely um, something that, you know, we, we'd like to be able to do more of, um, but ha have a really great entrepreneurship um, ecosystem support, you know, with ESOs here that, that can, that can provide those services. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And, and Philip, I think um, I'm going to direct this to you. So you talked a lot about behavior change. Um, I, I know we've had a lot of conversations about changing the behavior of financial institutions. So what criteria do you have for financial institutions? And, and I, I think this is really speaking to, if they're going to access some of the, um, the, the loan loss reserves through this program, what, how are you gonna screen them? How are you gonna hold their feet to the fire? I'll just put it that way. I'll rephrase this a little bit. Can you speak yeah. to that generally? Uh, generally, I think well, the first is, as far as um, what the first part of the question, Deb, I'm sorry, was Did, I don't speak to the fire. The first part is, is it resources for them? It's um, what are the screening criteria? How are you going to um, assess and make sure that the way that this was framed is how do you make sure that they're not coming in and, and being predatory lenders and, and you end up supporting a yeah, a kind yeah. of behavior that you don't want to see. Yeah, thank you for that. It, it, you know, a pretty, it's really a rubric together that um, this goes back to community first. So getting the input from the community, what we've been doing is getting input from entrepreneur support organizations here in Kansas City um, to give us input on what we believe, uh, what they believe, entre not only entrepreneurs need, but some input on the type of institutions that really should be in the program and not in the program and or questions to then run by or screen the institutions ranging ranging from you know what type of lending have they done what type of lending will they be doing what what is their commitment to it um what practices and data do they have to prove what they've been doing in the past and what they may not have data about what they may be doing in the future, but it's a, it's a range and rubric of questions that really look at with input from the community of making sure 
that there is commitment there. One, understanding, do you understand the low and moderate income tracks to start with? Um, and do you have the education inside or what education might be needed inside your, or your institution in order to help lenders um, understand how to make these best decisions and how not to make, make decisions? And so it's those type of criteria that you have to, you have to set um, in advance because you want to make sure that they're not doing those those type of things and or do they have a history of doing them do they right. not understand things but again starting with community first which we've been doing with the entrepreneur support organizations has been very very helpful because they're close very close to the entrepreneurs and understanding what these folks have been through yeah yeah great thank you for that we talked a little bit about data but let me pose this question um and and del maybe we start with you how important is it is the role of an organization like the Fed or or like Kaufman in providing data and research to back up the work of AltCap and other C CDFIs when making the case to foundations for funding and support? <clears throat> you know what pieces of data are needed most to make the case, and we touched on this a little bit and and talked about Kaufman's um, business plan. But what is the role of, for the Fed? Yeah. I you know, Fed's a unique animal because um, we're not one bank. You know, we're 12 institutions. Ruben, Ruben knows he's on our big board now after coming up <laughs> in our Bible bill. But, um, you know, we're 12 regional banks by design, which is important because it allows us a very um, deep understanding of the region that we serve. But what it also means is outside of some, you know, things that we do do that are consistent across all 12 banks, we can research different types of things. And so when you have us as well as the Board of Governors, I think, um, and this is a circular answer to the argument, I think it's important that each bank is kind of starting to look at these things. I mean, we had a big racism in the economy series that went on last year where we were really trying to explore the impacts of systemic racism on a variety of factors across the national economy, including you know, entrepreneurship. Um, and so like the, the research that we produce really does certain things in the marketplace because of our institutional credibility, it enhances the profile of that particular topic. And so we do do work around CDFIs. And I think there's, I, I, honestly, I think there's space for us to do significantly more around criti critical data questions. Um, you know, like I would love to see something done on, you know, how CDFIs were deploying capital during the pandemic and the, and the, the response rate. And, and just the, the example, that I give, and I answer it because the data that we, in the research we do is so all over the place. And I think it does, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna again, turn this over to your audience. Like you all saying to us, these are the things that we need, give impetus internally for us to then go around and say, hey, this is a great research idea, have we considered it? So it's kind of this yin yang circular, you know, relationship that we have with the community. And so if you all want more of this kind of research, reach out to local people like me in community development or regional, regional affairs, or if you get a chance to talk to the president at an economic forum, say, hey, I was on a, I was on a webinar with Ruben Dell and mm -hmm. Philip, and it, it would be great if you did more research on CDFIs that looked like this. Um, but all of that to say the data is important. Last point on that, like I wrote the report on Black women startups. That has had significant impact, and it's a qualitative data piece. It's not even quantitative. It's qualitative, but the amount of people that then would take could take that and say, hey, black women are important business owners. We need to figure out a way to resource them up has been huge in the marketplace. And so, so we need more of the folks that like us, like Kaufman, like other major institutions that continue to put this stuff out there. So Ruben can take it to funders, to bankers, to policymakers and say, hey, this is why you know, you, you making that extra billion dollars of investment in this is important. Yeah. And, and I just want to, I want to build on one thing that you said, Del, because I, I, I can be an admitted data geek every now and again, but I think the point that you make about stories, you know, being able to put a face to the lending that AltCap is doing or that, that VCC is doing, especially in foundation boardrooms, I think is so critical because it it th this can get pretty wonky pretty quickly, 
as you start to think about it, but putting a face on this, these are the kinds of people that are going to be supported through the efforts that we're talking about, just feels very important in terms of making the, the value proposition very, very clear uh, to foundation boards. So I, I appreciate that role that um, the Fed can play or others can play. In a related question, <laughs> This came from uh, someone in the audience. What role can we, the folks on this webinar, play in changing the banking, banking and lending policies? You know, we, we talked about this from a regulatory perspective. Amir said policy is happening there in Washington. What can the local economic developer or community foundation program officer that might be on this call, what what are the possibilities for them in, in impacting banking policy, lending behavior? What do you think about that? Call a convening. If you've got the, if you're an organization and convening power, go to, and back to what um, Dell was saying, don't overcomplicate it, make it simple. Call five institutions. Hey, we want to get in the room with you and we want to talk through things. Here's our perspective, because sometimes they, they may not know, they may have heard it before, but they need to hear it again. And again, coming with, and here, here's what our understanding is, here's more data that we've learned, et cetera. And just starting with those, those conversations and building those relationships and understanding, because that's what we've done here in Kansas City over the, over the years, is just building trust and understanding and filling in blanks for everyone has been very important. Yeah. That's one, one idea. Other thoughts? I think there's 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 formal and informal you know mechanisms for it. Like so, so much policy around the regulations. We we did have CRA modernization that just came was coming up, and there's opportunities for open comments on that. That's Community Reinvestment Act for those of you that are not aware, and that's what I mentioned before that every bank that puts into a a, a CDFI automatically get CRA credit for that, that activity. But from just a, a traditional policy perspective, I, I honestly believe this. We have a very narrow window at this point in time based upon the impact of the pandemic, the impact of social, what I call social justice summer with George Floyd, the, the, um, the, the, the rising pro, the raised profile around, you know, issues of equity in the economy um, to, to really kind of see if we can get some leverage in some marketplaces. And so there's a traditional advocacy role where you actually are, are advocating for, um, you know, well thought out policy solutions that can kind of make lending more equitable. Um, and then there's what kind of what I think Philip is doing in Kaufman, which is, I think is fairly novel, is he's trying to move the needle within the structure of the policies that currently exist by making the banks more responsive, because there's a lot of things financial institutions can do within their box that they don't do because maybe they haven't been asked to do, or maybe they don't know how. We can't make assumptions. So like the, the, the lending, um, as I understand it, the lending tra lender training that Kaufman and, and the Financial Services Coalition, Urban Financial Services Coalition are doing, it's not changing policy, it's trying to change minds and it's trying to change behavior. And so there's a lot of space in that. Like last example, so I, I'm a reformed business banker, um, you know, so that's where I started my career. And there were, there were clearly deals that could have been done that didn't get done because a banker didn't advocate for them or that they did get done because a banker advocated for them that were in these kind of that, those, those narrow spaces. There's also ways bankers can interact with the community, can interact with CDFIs that they may currently not be, not be doing. Like how do we de deepen the relationship so that a no is not necessarily a no, but a not now. And a lot of that is the partnerships they have with a Ruben that they have with other organizations where, okay, we can't do this deal or we can't do it without a partnership with Ruben. Like these are things within the regulatory wheelhouse that currently exists. And so you have that side of it. And then you have the traditional advocacy side where you're going to Washington and to other places and saying, we really think more thoughtful policy needs to be done so that we can protect the financial institutions and the monetary policy system of the United States, but at the same time, make it more equitable. Yeah, I'll just add, I mean, I think CDFIs are uniquely positioned to, to speak out on this, um, both representing small businesses and 
you know, how the financial system, you know, works for some and not others, um, but also just CD, you know, being a CDFI and, and demonstrating, you know, how having more flexibility in lending can, can actually lead to, uh, to more, more loans, uh, to more small businesses. Great. Thank you. And I, I think that notion Dell of don't making us don't make assumptions, you know, sit down and have a conversation of we've, we've got this potential. This is a, a challenge we want to address. How do we figure out how to do it? And, you know, Philip, to your point, getting four or five of those institutions in a room and saying, how are we going to solve this in, in, in this community um, yeah. and bringing that collective thinking to mm -hmm. the table? Yeah. It's so important. There was one, one other question I want to um, pull from the chat. Um, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to add to this a little bit, but how do you lever, how do you take the ecosystem work that's happening in a place, um, the entrepreneurial ecosystem, investment ecosystem work, you may have some funding to get it started, but how do you begin to leverage that so that you really begin to create the kind of impact that you need to see in, in, uh, an ecosystem? How do you leverage? What what are what are some of the opportunities to to go from? Well, we've got a grant from one foundation to build the ecosystem, but how do you really begin to scale that and attract other funders and partners to the table? Thoughts on that? Sort of back to the 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 building blocks and science of ecosystem building, some design principles that we have up on our web on our uh, ecosystem playbook. At Kaufman.org forward slash playbook is that look so much about this is 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 trust building and developing relationships and do you have do you have everyone aligned in your ecosystem around what the initiatives are or what you're trying to achieve because if the funding actually comes comes before you have that alignment then you're caught a little flat footed and it's like but what should we actually do here? So ecosystem building and developing trusted ecosystems start with you know a, a group and you start small. Who are the, the folks that I know that really understand the ecosystem and what our challenges are, what our opportunities are, and then who else needs to be in that room and start to bring in the other parties from different factors and factions, et cetera, so that you have a pathway and a roadmap forward. Now, if you don't have that already, um, I would say it's not too late to start. <laughs> it, it, it really isn't um, too late to start, but it's about a, a coalition and alignment because it's about moving the ecosystem from being disconnected to connected so that resources move. This is not my line, it's someone else's. Resources move from those who have it to those who need it in the fastest amount of time with the least amount of friction. And um, so that, that ability to have alignment from different parties is just really important. That's what I would add to that. Yeah. And, and Ruben and, and, yep. uh, and Del may have something else there. Anything to add? I, I think you hit the nail on the head. You can tell Philip's the old community organizing guy. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, 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 these are fundamental truths that, that they, they people just need to understand that yeah. you, you can't one off your way into sustainability because what happens is one organization eats and another starves. And I've seen that time and time again in my 30 plus years of doing community development work is that if you don't have a, a, a well-connected and trust-based ecosystem in place in any type of community development world, but especially ecosystem building, what you tend to create is winners and losers in competition with a high degree of scarcity mentality. And so the only way to avoid that is by really, like Philip said, you know, building that trust-based network so that you can start moving as a collective. Because usually what, what I found is that funders of all types, municipal funders, philanthropic funders, corporate funders, are much more responsive to people that, that are working towards something in tandem mm -hmm. versus as an individual. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so, so it's, it's beginning, you know, to work together, especially in a field which I would argue has been highly underfunded, um, going back, you know, for decades, which is the small business support space. So you got to work together, you got to figure it out. 
Um, I know it's not an answer that a lot of people want to hear. You know, they want, hey, what kind of grant can I write? What kind of pathway I can pursue? And there's things that can do that. I'm sure Ruben can talk about some of the things he's done. But from the bigger picture perspective, you know, you, you what, what's the African proverb? If you want to go fast, walk along, alone. But if you want to go far, walk together. Yep. That's a perfect note to end on in, in some ways. So, uh, Del, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to point to a, a couple of things. Um, just really quickly, don't make assumptions. Buy coffee and go talk to the community. Um, were three three things that came out. But let, let me just say that um, we when we set out to design this panel, panel, we really wanted those of you who are on the webinar to walk away with, with a few things. One was a deeper understanding of the importance of partnerships between philanthropy and community development, financial institutions, other ecosystem partners to really address some of these systemic capital challenges in underinvested places. And, and I, I think I think we've started to build that um, that understanding here. So I really appreciate um, our panelists today. We also wanted to pr provide you with an appreciation for some of the new roles that philanthropy can play using both financial and non-financial capital. I think we heard a lot about your convening power that uh, Kaufman has had uh, to address the community's most significant opportunities for transformative investment. And so again, I hope this is helping foundations in the audience, but also people who are who seek to partner with philanthropy to have a different uh, lens to bring to the roles that they play. We also wanted to really highlight the unique role that we think CDFIs play in addressing capital gaps and the capacity support they need to do even more. And so uh, again, recognizing that there are other financial institutions out there, but really showing a spotlight on community development financial institutions as mission aligned partners with philanthropy. And then most importantly for me, I hope we're leaving you with some optimism that it's possible to address even the most entrenched capital challenges with commitment and creativity by public, private and philanthropic ecosystem partners that we can do this. We can step into these spaces and address these challenges. So I hope we've achieved those ends. Uh, thanks to Philip, and Ruben and Dell, we really appreciate your time and just sharing your expertise. Again, there's lots of good stuff in the in the chat um, and just a lot of appreciation for everybody joining us today. Um, someone asked if there's a way to save the chat. I'm gonna use that as an opportunity to turn it over to Amir and let Valerie chime in on that. But thank you to the panel and Amir, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, thanks so much, Deb. And uh, Ruben, Dell, and Philip, again, to follow on Deb's comments, thank you so much for taking the time today on what to me was a really, really exciting and informative conversation for our field and how our fields of, of philanthropy, government, and CDFIs can partner together. Um, I then, Deb, also just want to thank you for, you know, leading this really powerful discussion. We really appreciate it. And to the audience, thank you for your willingness to join us today and, and, and provide so many thoughtful questions. Uh, but what I want know you all want is to get an answer to the simple question of how to save this. So I will just pass it on over to Deb. I'm sorry, back to, to Valerie. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Amir. Yes, uh, I'll answer the most pressing question first, which is the chat. So what I'm going to do is I'll go through the chat and I will pull um, all of the resources that uh, were dropped in there. And I will include those in the follow-up email um, that'll be sent to everyone who registered for the event next week. Um, so, so first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you, Amir. Thanks to Sarah and Deb, my colleagues, and to our wonderful panelists, Philip, Ruben, and Dell. Fantastic conversation. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the event, the recording of this session will be sent along with the resources from the chat um, to everyone who registered next week. Um, additionally, if you opted into email communications from Locus when you registered, you'll soon receive um, our June newsletter, which actually will include a feature article offering more insight related to this topic. So keep an eye out and um, please let us know what you think. Um, I also shared a link in the chat where you can learn more about past and upcoming learning exchange events. We'll have another one um, in September around climate and resiliency financing. Um, so stay tuned for more information about that. 
And finally, if you would like to stay in touch, please feel free to reach out to our team at Locus at the email address, which I also dropped in the chat. Um, and I think that's it. Thanks to all and have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining us today.